God, that in our inner man, we will be transformed and renewed. Lord, I pray that the old will go so that the new can come in and take its place. Father, thank you this morning. Even though you know my heart, I rejoice this morning because our names are written in the book of life. But Father, I thank you that you said you've prepared a place for us. And so we rejoice. But while we're here on earth, we have a mission. We have an assignment to bring Christ to the community. And I pray, Lord, you would raise us up strong and mighty this morning to do that which you've called and commissioned us to do in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to start this morning and just thank you. I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. And I want us to go to Matthew chapter 6. Now, the reason I want to go to Matthew 6 is because in Matthew, there are four key elements to these 34 verses in the 6th chapter of the book of Matthew. But contained in those 34 verses and the four pivotal points, there are nine principles that God lays down as Jesus was talking here. Jesus lays down nine principles of how we are to live our Christianity in the community. It's one of, it's one of few chapters in the Bible that condense it and consolidate it into a single chapter. You know, some, some books of the Bible, you've got to read different chapters to get the whole picture. But in Matthew chapter 6, God, by His wisdom and grace in compiling the Word, has crystallized living Christianity in the community. And I don't know about you this morning, church, we need to learn how to live our Christianity in the community. Our Christianity is not for a church building. Our Christianity is not for our little holy huddles. Our Christianity is a life-changing experience that we share with the world that they may see the love of God and they may come to Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. That's how we live our Christianity. You young folk this morning, you're not too young to live out your Christianity. Some of you older folk this morning, you're not too old to still live out your Christianity. Let us not waste one precious moment. The world is in a mess. People are dying daily. And sadly, many of them don't know the Lord. There's people this morning that don't go to church. They don't go to fellowship. They don't gather with the saints. Because somebody did not live out their Christianity and it caused them offense, it caused them hurt, it caused them bitterness and they have been missed by the body of Christ. To those that are watching on, on Facebook and YouTube, I want to say to you this morning, it's not a substitute. I'm glad you're getting the word and I love you. But it's not a substitute for being together as the gathering of the saints the coming together of the believers. You see, even in South Africa at this time, when the government have placed restrictions on the number of people that can gather, if we don't gather, and we fill the house to capacity, we're sending the wrong signal to the government. We are saying the church doesn't matter. Church matters, people. We don't have a reason why not to go to church. The reason we don't go to church is because we've made other things a priority. We've made other things higher value and higher priced than the gathering together of the believers. You see, when one is hurting, we should all be hurting. When one is joyful, we should all be joyful. So when we go to Matthew chapter 6 and we look at the, the four things that God sets down as foundations 
to live out our Christianity in the community. Let me tell you, number one, the giving of our good works, the giving of us, the giving of our talents, the giving of our time, the givings of our treasure, the giving of elms, the Bible calls it. God lays down in this chapter the right intention, the right manner, and the right methodology in giving of our alms. Secondly, He lays down the right intention, the right manner, and the right form, and the prerequisite of how to pray. Thirdly, the right intention and the right manner of fasting and seeking God. Lastly, the necessity of a pure intention in all things, unmixed, unpolluted with the desire for worldly riches, worldly cares, vain philosophies, but a pure heart to seek the Lord. And if we live those four things out and the nine principles that we're going to go through in the next couple of sessions, if we live that out in the community, I promise you, people will want what you got. But when we don't live it out, church, people will keep what they've got. So, you heard me say this, I'm going to say it again for completeness of, of, of text. <coughs> The word sow, S-O-W. We know the Bible says what you sow, you reap. But for sow today, I want to put S, full stop, O, full stop, W, full stop. The sow in my life stands for sustainability. Always being consistent, not wavering, not to and fro, not up one day and down the next, not to the left one day and to the right the next. Being consistent on the word of God. Adopting the power of the position of God's word. Adopting the power, listen to that. Adopting the power of the position of God's word. See, when we stand on God's word, we have power. When we stand on the things that God says, we have sustainability. The storm can blow, the tempest can come, but the boat shall not sink. Hallelujah, glory to God. And church, you're going to find in the next few weeks and going ahead, I am not preaching things that will tickle your ears. I want to stir you up. Hallelujah. You are soldiers and combatants in a, in a fight for life. Amen. We're in a battle for the souls of the lost. We're in a battle for territory and the principalities and powers over the nations to be pulled down and the name of Jesus to be risen up and glorified. Amen. Amen. Listen, man, throw away your slippers. Put away your pajamas. Take the curlers out of your hair. It's time to get dressed for battle. It's time to go out and fight. I'm looking for some lions of the tribe of Judah, not some pussycats. And you're going to hear over the next few weeks there's going to be a move of God on the nations of the earth that's going to be different to any other move that's ever been. Because yes, time is now. Yes. Just, you know, if you look at the crucifixion of Jesus, just when the devil thought he had him licked, the devil got his butt kicked. Amen. And just when he thought through COVID and pandemics and all the nonsense that he had the church flattened, he's going to get his butt kicked yes. again. Amen. Come on. But it's going to take the church to stand up and show our Christianity into the community. Amen. And when we walk around just like the world, when we walk around just like sin and death, nobody will be attracted to what we have. Christianity should be contagious. Yep. Yes. Christianity is contagious. Amen. We need to be contagious people consistently blessed consistently prosperous consistently standing on God's word the O stands for operating in a different spirit yep. the spies went out into the land and they came back with a report but there's walls and giants and grasshoppers and we can't take that territory 
I want to tell you, don't care about the grasshoppers. Stop being a church hopper. It's just as bad as a grasshopper. It's time that we operate in a different spirit. If God says nothing, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a different spirit to what the world's saying right now. You see, there's a lot of there's a lot of secular people that are fearful of COVID-19. But the church should not be fearful. Because we have in us the same spirit that rose Jesus from. Now you see, in this bottle there's water. How many of you know well, this water is good? Yeah. It's good. But let me tell you. <laughs> Dear Jesus. If I don't pour it out, it's of no <laughs> use to you. If I don't give you to drink of this water, this water is good. This water is beautiful. This water is refreshing. But if I don't give it to you, it's no good to you. Yeah. The church needs to stop being a reservoir yeah. and stop being an outflow of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Man, I want to be blessed. I want to go to every meeting. I want to listen to everything. Why? So we get fat and ugly. Yes. No. <laughs> so we can give to give out. Yeah. It's time we gave out more so that we desired more. It's time that we poured out more so that we got more. It's time the church woke up how the church became the living water flow into our community. Operating in a different spirit. Operating in a place where nobody else will go. Operating in a way where nobody else will operate. And thirdly, W, working with what we have. See, we don't have a lot, but what we have, we give to God. I hear people, you see people get into condemnation about giving. Well, I can't tithe because I don't have enough. You've got something, give it. Yeah. If you've got two cents, give one. If you've got two apples, give one. If you've got three apples, give two. You should only eat one apple at a time. We've got to learn to be givers, man. Yeah. We've got to learn to give everything that we have to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know that little boy that had the loaves and the fish? Thousands of people sitting on the grass, hungry, and all he had was a little bit of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. In the natural, somebody might say, well, that's not enough even to feed him. But when he gave what he had to God, God multiplied it to the multitudes. What have you got this morning that you can give? That God, in his grace and mercy, will multiply it to the multitudes. Living Christianity into the community. Well, I've got one bowl of soup. Well, will you go and share just one person? You can't feed the whole multitude in the natural with one bowl of soup, but you can feed one person that can change his life. We've got to get to a place, church, where we start understanding that we've got to work with what we've had and give what we have. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Let's talk about the things that, that the principles of four parts of this principle. The first principle is how to give. It says, be sure that you do not do your charitable deed before men to be seen by them. Yeah. Don't do it for vain glory. Mm -hmm. Don't do it to be recognized. Don't do it to be boastful and proud. God says, see that what you do, you do for Him, not for yourself. Take heed to yourself, the Bible says, that you do not do your merciful deeds before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of the Father in heaven, for you have already received your reward of men. You see, if I, if I start breaking this down, half the people that have given and so that's why they got upset. Well, I've given and I've, I've done this and I've done that. Nobody, nobody's acknowledged it. And God, you haven't honored it. And they get sulky. Why? Because they were seeking, if they really look at their heart, they were seeking the approval of man. God says, you've got your reward. Yes. But when you give it to God in secret, when you give it to God in worship, His reward will be in heaven for you. 
There's some folk that have got empty reward baskets in heaven. Because they've done it for vain glory, for the things of man. You see, if you go on to verse 2, Therefore, when you do your merciful deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. He's talking about the religious people doing it to be seen, doing it to be heard, doing it to be noted. Let's do it for Jesus. Let's do it for our King, not for the man. You see, I want to say this. We all have a little bit of us still left in us. So when you do a good deed for somebody that don't say thank you, don't get upset. Don't get twisted. Because you didn't do it for them, see? I'll tell you a story. Many, many years ago when I was pastoring in Colenso, that's a while ago. That's where I first met Scott, came to preach for us. A man came to my gate one morning and he said, Sir, I've lost my father and I need to go home to bury him. But I have no money. Can you help me? And I could see the, the stress on his face. And I said, Sure, I can help you. I went inside and got some money, went back to the gate, I gave him some money, I said, God bless you as you use this for your bus fare to, to travel home and go and look after your dad. And he looked at me and said, I'll repay you. When I come back, I'll come and give you the money. And off he went. And I stood there in my driveway and I prayed and said, Lord, I sow that to his life. Not expecting of a return. And months and months went by and I never saw this man. And then one Saturday morning there was a a ring at our gate and I went down and here was this man. His bicycle had boxes tied on onto the, the back behind the saddle. It had boxes tied on the front by the handlebars. And when I came out, I saw this massive smile on his face. And he said, I've come to repay you. And he handed me the boxes full of chickens. Oh, 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 oh dear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't say anything to anybody that I gave him money. I just met a need as of the Lord. And he paid it back. I had chickens to give away. <laughs> God, multiple. See, when we give church, what is the reason we give? Now, in, 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 in this ministry, we don't make an issue of giving. You've noticed that. We don't force people to give. Giving is an act of worship. Giving is sacrificial to surrender to my God. See, one of the teachings has been false in the body of Christ. People say, God needs your money. God doesn't need your money. God created everything anyway. God doesn't need our money. God wants our obedience. God wants to see our heart. Where your heart is, your treasure is. Where your treasure is, your heart is there also. See, when in verse 2, when God was speaking here, when Jesus was ministering, he was drawing a parallel to the Sanhedrin, to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that made a big show of their giving. Now, in those times, in, those, in, those, in that era, the rich people, when they came to areas of poverty, they would throw coins at people. It was the way they um, garnished popularity. Like the politicians, just before an election, they start giving out food parcels. Have you noticed yeah. that? It's the same spirit. Winning votes. Coercing people to vote for them because they only give them food parcels just a week or so before an election. The rest of the four or five years, they get nothing. Yes, yeah. God says, don't let that giving be in the church. I've seen fellowships where they make more... They pay more attention and they give more credit to the, to the more affluent people in the church than the other people. Because those pastors, God bless them, but they're relying on, on those ministers, those business people to be givers in the church. Everybody should be a giver, proportional to your, your, your own means. You see, if we look at the scripture where Jesus said, the widow that gave a pence gave more than the rich man. What pence can we give to God this morning? 
Maybe you've got a pair of old shoes. Or maybe you've got a pair of new shoes that you can give to somebody that's got no shoes. Let me tell you how much those shoes will mean to somebody. You've got, ladies, I know you've got cupboards full. Bless you. Men, men normally have two or three. That's it, finished. But, but women, women can have a whole lot. But can you imagine? You've got 20 pairs of shoes. And you just give one pair of shoes in secret, in silence, but on, on, the, on the honor to God. You give somebody that's bare feet and blistered, you give them a pair of shoes. How much joy you bring into their life. Again, years ago, when my sons were still very small, but they'd grown out of their first, uh, what's the first thing, three to six months or, or zero to three months baby clothes. And we were in a supermarket. And I saw this lady standing, staring at all the baby stuff in the, on the shelves. And I asked her, because uh, she was not, a, not tall and neither am I, but I just asked her, uh, can I help you? She said, you know, I've got a little baby and I need some clothes, but sure, oh, it's expensive. And I said to her, if you come with me and go to my house, we've got some children that are now growing up and I've got a whole lot of young baby uh, age group that we don't need anymore and if you would take it they're second hand they've been used but if you would take them we'd want to bless you with all that stuff i took her home and she got bags of baby stuff nappies and and baby growers and cute little things and many many years later i was preaching in a in a congregation down on the south coast of kwazulu natal and i was telling the story and the whole church i saw them looking around and they were looking at this woman in the back and I asked, what's happening? And the woman came up and she walked down the aisle. She said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, I don't. Because I'm the lady that you gave those clothes to. And because of that gift of love, I'm serving Jesus today. See, that was in the time of apartheid when whites didn't bless black people. We persecuted black people. Those who weren't saved and filled with the Spirit of God. And here's this woman that must have been hurt in the times that, they learned, that we lived in. But a, a gift of love, a gift of charity that was done silently changed her life. And she started to serve Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I want to tell you. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Everybody was crying. Now when I gave her those clothes, I didn't give it for that reason. I gave it to help somebody. Paying it forward to somebody that they may be blessed. You never know your testimony. You never know what you give when you give it with a good heart and a pure heart where that seed will be planted and what will grow from that thing. Give. Give. Not like the Sanhedrin. Not like the, 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 the Pharisees that want a trumpet and a fanfare. Look what I gave. You know, if somebody said to me, Derek, I want to give you 50 to 100,000 rand to finish this building. I would love that. And if you want me to put your name on the door and name it off, you know, I'd do that too. But I would hope you said just put Jesus on the door. Yeah, Amen. Mean. See, so many people want their reward. They don't understand. They want their reward on earth instead of their reward in glory. Yeah. Today, my friend and my brother Scott have got his reward in glory. He's sitting with all the generals. He's having a chat with Abraham. Okay. Skolk was a worshipper. He's playing and he's having musical sessions with David right now. Oh. Praise God. Amen. I rejoice. I rejoice that he's in heaven. Yeah. I'm sad that he's not here in the natural anymore. But I rejoice that he's in heaven. He was a worshipper. He could play. He could make a guitar talk. I can imagine the jam session he's having with David right now. <laughs> Man, they would just be mixing it up. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, when you do, verse 3, but when you do your merciful deeds, do not let, let your left hand know what your right hand does. Sometimes we just got to be faithful in our giving. Sometimes we just got to say, Lord, I'm giving it because you want me to. How many times have you asked God, what must I give? We need to be in a place that we
we give abundantly. And if you give abundantly, God will reward you abundantly. See, when we're going to live our Christianity into the community, are we givers? When you're in the supermarket, are you a giver in the supermarket? Helping other people. I love helping people. It's my nature. Here's my father's heart. Giving to the needy, giving to the poor. You know, I want to talk about the, the, the church of God in Pakistan and India. You know, there's something that distinguishes them from the Western church. We, I don't want to go and take a Western cultural indoctrination to those people. I want to go and learn from them. You know why? Because if you look on, even on Facebook, do the research, go look for yourself. Many, many, many of those pastors, they're running orphanages and homes for the widows. They're not building mega churches with rich people. They're looking after widows and orphans. Children. You know how great their reward's going to be in heaven. That's hard work. Looking after children's hard work. Looking after widows and orphans is hard work. But they do it out of love. Because there's so many people that are affected by the economics of their countries that they are poor and they're benevolent. And those pastors go and they care for those people. Look at Mother Teresa. Look how she gave in the streets of Calcutta. How she blessed those poor people in the slums. I would rather have Mother Teresa preach than some fancy celebrity preacher. Because her heart was pure, man. See, church, we need, to get a, we need to get a wake up. That we're here not for ourselves. We're here to serve our community with Christ. If anything, how many of you when you were growing up were waiters? How many of you ever had, had that thing where you had to be a waiter? Come on, don't be ashamed. I ran front of house for a restaurant. I wasn't a waiter. I ran front of house. Man, it was hard. You know, we didn't have fancy watches and phones with step counters in those days. But if we did, I think that I had to make one with six digits. Because, man, you know what it's like to do a six-hour shift, how far you run up and down. It's not a short, it's not a long distance, but you run up and down, up and down, up and down. You put miles on those shoes. I want to tell you, if, 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 if I've got a title that I want to bestow on somebody as a Christian in the community, I'm going to call you waiter. Serving people with love, joy, peace, kindness, mercy, goodness, patience, long-suffering. We are waiters waiting on the community to bring them the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. No, we want to be in the front. We want to have a fanfare. No, we're waiters. We're servants. <laughs> Jesus said if you want to be great in the kingdom, be a servant. When last did you go to your neighbor and wash their car? When they're away, did you go and cut their grass? God's calling us to change our community by showing them the love of God in practical things, not just preaching it on a Sunday in a building called the church. It's time the church got out of the walls. It's time the church broke down some of the walls and got free to be Christ in the community. You see, we've got to get to somewhere. Chapter 5 of Matthew spoke about attitude. And I didn't start there because we're going to go back there. I started with what God says about giving. Because you know what? You know what affects more people than anything else? Finances. Yes. You want to get somebody's attention? Yeah. Get hold of their finances. Yep. Or their health. Oh, yes. You'll get them down on their knees quicker than any head block, any arm twist, or any pressure point. Touch their finances and their health, watch how they fail. In church right now, the economy of our, of, our, of our nations, the economies of the world, are all being changed because of a man-made restriction. And the church better not falter into that thing. The church better not get sucked down that same whirlpool. The church better stand up and arise in the name of Jesus. 
See, God cautions us in this chapter. In verse 1, He's cautioning us against vain glory. Vain glory. He's cautioning us against vain glory. He's saying, don't let your good works be boasted about by men. And see, we're going to learn how to be submissive. We're going to learn how to be subjective. When somebody comes and pays you a compliment, don't be rude. Well, it's not me, it's for the Lord. See, that's rude. Just receive and say thank you. Then immediately say, Lord, I just give it to you. I give you all the honor. I give you all the praise. Amen. We need to learn. See, God has a general caution. We need to understand how to love our neighbor. How do you love the unlovable? Well, with the love of God. Can't love it with our own love. We love the unlovable with the love of God because the love of God changes things. And I want to tell you, they'll resist for a while, but they can't resist forever. When we show them love, when we are Christ to our community, when we bring Christianity into our community, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about the Sanhedrin and the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees that wanted to blow a trumpet and have a fanfare. I'm talking about a Christian that's a servant and a waiter. Let's go wait on people. Let's go serve them. You know, when, when folk, even in this, in this team, when people come and just bring us a meal, I don't care if it was bovril on toast. The fact that you brought us a meal blesses us out of our boots. Because it's the spirit in which it's given. I remember back in the days when we used to have church congregational bras, you know, bring in bra. It was hard, and I had to say to the people, and I'd say, everybody bring voice. Yes, you know why? Because somebody would bring their fillet steak, mm -hmm. somebody would bring their yes. tenderized steak, mm -hmm. and now there's, well, mine's better than yours. Oh, and yeah. hey, look, they're eating our steak. Sis on you. <laughs> Stupidity causes division in the church. We should be blessed when somebody comes to service. If we've got enough finances to buy some fillet steak, we should only be too blessed to be able to share that steak with somebody that may, even in their life, have you ever thought about it, may have never tasted fillet steak in their whole life. And you're having a hissy fit because they're eating your steak. Now some of you might say, Gary, this is a bit harsh. Oh, I haven't even got started yet. <laughs> it's time the church woke up to be lovers of God's kingdom and love, show the love of God to the people. Imagine how blessed it would be if you just made a beautiful meal and found somebody that was less fortunate than yourself and just said, I want to give you this meal. Give them a fillet steak. Give them a roast. Mm. You know, back in the 80s, there was a move on religiousness. See, God hates religion. And there was a thing where women weren't allowed to wear slacks, pants to church. Oh, and if it was all dressed in black, they were of the devil. <laughs> what a lot of twack. Thank God they come to church. I remember doing a baptismal service one day and it was my fault. I didn't explain it properly because I just took it for granted, see. And half of the young people in the youth that came for baptism, they all they took off their, their, their tops and their, their, their skirts to get baptized. They're all wearing bikinis. Okay, we've got a small problem. Thank God that some of the ladies in the fellowship were just quick on their feet and no condemnation, just love them, just cover them up. See, they, it's a pool, it's water, they don't know any different. Yes. Now do you chase them away or do you baptize them in a bikini? You baptize, you baptize them. Amen. But you see, the religious got all stirred up. <laughs> Sis on you. You Sanhedrin. Whitewashed sepulchre. <laughs> see, we got to start. See, we, we, had a, we, had a, we had a pastor's meeting the other night. And we started to talk about this thing, and I'm going to teach on it soon. What is judgment? 
See, the church has been wrongly advised. Thou shalt not judge. Lest you be judged. Now, I agree. The Bible says that. But when you look at the root word, it's not talking about judging as in discerning and separating right from wrong. That judgment is condemnation. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, there's now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So you shouldn't be condemning people because they're not condemned. But we should be able to judge what's right, what's biblical, and what's not biblical. See, the devil came with a lie that keep the church silent. So when our brothers in error or our sisters in error, we don't correct them, we just smile at them. I don't smile at sin. I don't smile at error. I want to always act in a, uh, in a spirit of love. And I want to love people and, and help and love. See, I don't like the word correction either. I'd rather use the word alignment. Yeah. And some of you that are on team with us here, you've realized that there's been times when I've had to align you. Amen. I've never judged you, never criticized you, never condemned you. But I've had to align you. Yes. Because your alignment to the word will bring you life. Yes. Amen. We need the fivefold ministry in the body of Christ to be aligned. So we teach aligned theology. We teach aligned doctrine so that the church, the body of Christ, can be aligned to the word. Not aligned to man, not aligned to the philosophies of men, but aligned to the word of God, the power of God unto salvation. So the first one this morning is giving. How are we giving? With what attitude and spirit are we giving this morning, church? Are we giving people the PDI because we don't like them? That's giving. Giving people a cold shoulder because we don't like them. Or previously they offended us. That's not the giving that God wants in our hearts. God wants us to give with a pure heart. See, I've said to you many times, I can't be offended. And you know why I can't be offended? Not because I'm great, not because I'm smart, not because I'm better than anybody else. Because I've put that thing down at the feet of Jesus and I refuse to pick it up. I can get sad. I can get disappointed at people. True story. But I'm not offended. You know, if you take a snake, a snake has a natural inclination to bite you. That's all it knows. It knows when it's fearful, it must attack. So don't play with the snake. It's not a pet. It will try and bite you. Am I right? So when it bites you, why are you offended at the snake? Why do you want to chop its head off and smash it into the ground with a spade? You know it's a snake. You know it's going to bite you. Why don't you go play with it? Similar, hurting people hurt. Hurting people are, 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 are volcanoes waiting to erupt at the wrong moment. Know that they're going to erupt. So when they erupt, just step out of the way. If you get some splatter on your shoes, clean it off. Because you're not the target. They hurt. It's just projecting out of there. You're not the target. Don't take it personally. See, if we don't get offended, we'll go back and love the unlovable. Mm. We'll go back and bless them, even though they, they swear at you and they curse at you. See, are we prepared to give like that to save the community? Well, they shunned me. They chased me away. They spat at me. Many years ago, I had a, a, a work colleague that... One day he said to me, in the workplace, I want you to stop preaching Jesus. I said, can't do that, sorry. And I was ministering to somebody in the office. And he happened to come into the office. And he manifested. He was a big man. He was a tall man. He picked me up by the throat and he lifted me off the ground and he put me against the wall, holding me by the throat. My feet were clean off the ground. And he was choking me. And I just smiled at him. 
couldn't speak because he had my voice box squashed. But I just smiled. And after a couple of seconds, he put me down. And I just said to him, I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I walked away. About four or five months later, he had to go on an assignment with me, and so he had to ride in the car with me. <laughs> Bad choice. So I decided I wasn't going to preach. Because I like my throat, see? So I put on a teaching tape. And this pastor was preaching his heart out. And this guy got quieter and quieter and quieter in the passenger seat. Then all of a sudden he got this revelation of perfume. He says, that's you preaching. I said, you're right. She couldn't throttle the tape. <laughs> but I had the privilege weeks later to lead him to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Being consistent in our giving. See, if we give once and it's not appreciated and we don't go back, because then it tells me a little bit that our giving, we wanted some physical reward on earth instead of in heaven. Again, I remember visiting a family 42 weeks, every week for 42 weeks, to get them to come to churches. 42 weeks. And on the 42nd week, on the Tuesday I visited them, on the Sunday, for the first time, that whole year, 42 weeks, they came as a whole family, they came to fellowship. After 42 weeks. Some, other, some of the leaders said to me, you know, but there's so many other people to visit. Why do you keep going to them? They're not coming. He said, because God gave me an assignment. And I'm going to wear them down. <laughs> and I wore them down. And they came to Jesus. So we prepare to operate in a spirit of giving. Not when it's convenient. Not when it gives us something back. But when it gives everything to God. Amen. Amen. Are you a cheerful giver? See, the, the Sanhedrin that he's talking about in chapter chapter 6, verse 3, if they didn't get a fanfare and a trumpet blast and, and everybody clapping and lining the streets for them like celebrities, they didn't want to give. They didn't want to show up. And I'm sad to say that in, our, in the kingdom of God today, we've got some celebrity preachers. They won't come unless there's a fanfare. They won't come unless they're guaranteed a number of people to preach to. They won't come unless you put $20,000 in their bank account before they leave home. Now I understand that's called business. I want them to understand this is called word. I'll go all of, halfway across the world. If God tells me to go and preach for five, to 5, 10, to 15 people, it's not the number. It's who you're doing it for. Yes. Church, I want to encourage you this week. Be a cheerful giver. Find a way to give what you have. Might not be much. Materially or work, physically or financially, but what you have. Remember what Peter and John said when they went down to the pool? Silver and gold have I none, but such that I have, give I unto thee. What have you got today that you can give someone? Darling, why don't you just come up here? I want to show somebody what you got. Everybody's got this. Promise. Everybody can do this. Yes. What did it cost you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Thank you. I just want to like you. <laughs> <laughs> when last did you just hug somebody and love them? Hold their hands and just pray for them. A gentle, simple, serene prayer to bless them. It didn't cost anything. Maybe seven seconds of your time. We've well, got 168 hours in a week. Seven seconds is not a lot to give. God wants us to take Christianity to the community. They're not going to come into the church house where the church is just yet. Because their file, their reference is hurt, bitter, broken. Judged, condemned. 
So who needs to reach them? I want you to look next to you and see the empty chair that's next to you this morning. Or in front of you or behind you. You know why that chair is there? So that you can bring somebody to fill that chair. That chair is not here to fill up the space. That chair is reserved for somebody to come and serve God together. That chair is there for you to fill. This week, invite people to church. See, I'm not saying go and grab them and tie them and haul them in the, behind your vehicle. Although that might work. What I'm saying is, just invite. Let God do the work. You know, as, as human beings, how many of you are a little shy? Come on, be honest. When you get into a crowd where you don't know anybody, what do you tend to do? Just sit in the corner. Try and become inconspicuous. How do you think folk, when they come to a congregation, they don't know anybody, how do you think they feel? Probably just the same. That's why we've got to go and build friendship with them so that when they come, they know you. That you, they came with you or you meet them at the gate and you bring them into fellowship. And you sit with them. You fellowship. And say, say you're one of those people that always sit in the same seat. And you get there on a Sunday morning and somebody else is sitting in your seat. What do you do? Excuse me, that's my seat. Move. No. You find, yeah. another, you find another seat. God hates religion. God hates religion. I went one day to minister as the guest speaker to preach for a pastor. And I came, we prayed in the back before the service. I'd come out about five minutes before the service started, went and sat on the front row. Not because I want to sit on the front row, it's just convenient to get up to come to the podium. And a woman walked up to me, didn't know me because I'd never been to that fellowship before. Excuse me, excuse me, sir, you're sitting in my seat. Now, I just said, well, I'm the preacher. I just smiled, got up and I went and sat right in the back. Then when it was time to minister, the pastor was looking on the front row for me and he couldn't find me. And then he, he caught my eye at the back. And he asked me to come forward and I walked to the front. That was the longest walk that woman's ever watched. <laughs> Because I have fun, see. Because where I sit, don't matter. Don't become so religious that you want to stamp your name on something. The only thing that we should stamp on, put a name on, is the name of Jesus. Yes. Only thing we should want to glorify is Christ and Christ crucified and raised from the dead. So church, I want to tell you this morning, I want this fellowship, I want this gathering of the saints to get out and be Christianity to the community. I want us to have things this year that we've never done before. I want us to do activities like you did yesterday with the, with the, with the training, the kids' hearts training. You had fun. Now, how many children do you think there are just around here that have nobody that takes time and attention with them? How many of those young people have never had an adult that will show them one inch or drop or ounce of kindness? I want to ask you a question. How much do, and I don't know, see, how much do those little box of Easter eggs, those marshmallow Easter eggs cost? 50 bucks. Probably 60 by now. Yeah. Okay, 60 bucks. I want to ask you, and I haven't thought about this just as I'm standing here this morning. I want everybody to put in an envelope, as you can, as the Lord leads, put on an envelope Easter eggs. Because Easter's coming. And I want us to get a few boxes of Easter eggs and go find a community with young kids and just go and bless them with a marshmallow Easter egg. Now, listen, the religious, oh, we don't believe in Easter eggs at Easter. No, neither do I. I'm giving a sweet to a child yes. with a meaning behind it in Jesus' name. Yes. Who's with me? Who will come and give out Easter eggs? Yes. You know, when I travel, when I travel into Africa and I go minister in Africa, I always... In my suitcases, take those big bags. Have you know those boiled sweets? Yes. I mean, I don't like them. 
<laughs> but you know, you have a, a group uh, in a congregation and somewhere in the middle of Africa, you start giving those children, those little boys who watch the, the absolute delight on their face. Something you probably wouldn't eat. But to them, there's such a delight on their face. <laughs> See, that's, a, that's ministry in action, praise God. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, church, I'm looking at you. You never expected to get that, did you? No. But you know what? I see the look on your face because you've got something. How much more can we take boxes of those Easter eggs and go and give it to the people that have probably never had one of those in a long time? And with it, we just give them the love of God. Amen? Are you blessed this morning? Yes. Have I stirred your heart a little bit this morning? Yes. Will you come back next week? Yes. Amen. Amen. Because we're going to, you know what we're going to get into next week? We're going to get into the Lord's Prayer. Hallelujah. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Where does God want his kingdom? On earth. On earth. <laughs> as it is in heaven. How do you think the kingdom on earth looks compared with the kingdom in heaven right now? I thought the Lord, I don't want to stay in that even. No, of course it's if that's what heaven's like, if it had passed, God's called us to populate the earth with the glory of Him. The church of God. Let's stand and pray again. Trust your place. Trust your motivated, stirred up this morning. Ignited, delighted, and ignited. Father, I pray. Take, take the hand of your neighbor. Take your hand of your neighbor right now. Thank you, Jesus. So you be shut Father, I thank you this morning that the body of Christ is a giving body. Lord, the body is not a religious body that gives to get reward on earth, not gives to be seen, not gives to be accoladed, but Lord, gives to you, for you to be glorified. So I pray this morning right now, Lord, a, a new, fresh spirit of giving on every single one that is in team. I pray, Lord, for a new revelation of giving. I pray for a new anointing of giving on your people, through your name and for your glory. Lord, I pray this morning that people will be wanting to give. They'll be excited to give. It won't be a grudge give. It'll be a worship give. And so, Lord, I pray this morning as we learn to give, we learn to be waiters and servants in our community. We learn to be shepherds of love, shepherds of goodness and mercy into a lost and a dying world. Father, help us today to learn how to give with a joyful heart. Learn how to give with a pure heart. Learn how to give with a joyful heart and a heart and a praise of thanksgiving. Father, bless us this morning. I ask that we, we, we would receive so that we could give, not that so we could hoard. Bless us today, Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. and amen.